Let's say the first thing that gets me out of bed in the morning, the thing that drives me, the thing that causes me to, to live and move, to breathe, to reach out to people is that I am in love. I'm in love with Jesus. I experienced his love for the first time at 16 at the time when I needed this love most. You know, I was broken. Many of us have experienced brokenness, but the brokenness I experienced was so dark and so miserable that I, I didn't even want to live anymore. And then I got to experience God's love, His embrace, when I deserved it the least. And as a result, after experiencing that love, it wasn't about the feeling. It was about, okay, I need to do something about this. I need to tell the world about this love. And this was, what, over 25 years ago and I haven't stopped. I haven't stopped. I'm actually more driven now than I've ever been in my life. But at the same time, this part of me just saying, ha. Huh, I wonder if, if, if Jesus, if you're done with me, I, will, I won't have hard feelings because sometimes I'm, I feel tired. But at the same time, I cannot. I can't stop because I'm still in love. I still see a world that needs to, to experience this love that I have experienced. And what led you to the priesthood? I mean, so you have this beautiful encounter with Jesus at the age of 16 that's moved you from your brokenness to, the, to this love, this passion that's driving you. Then what, how did the priesthood come into play into this? Well, after living uh, many years of addiction, many years away from, from anything that was um, close to the dignity that God had given me, I, I had this encounter with, with God and I needed to tell the world about it. And I started doing this by playing music. This is how I started to evangelize. I grabbed my guitar, I learned music, I became excellent at what I did and I went on every platform I could find on every social media platform at the time, every open door that I could find, I would talk about Jesus. But I used to, I had this passion to speak about Jesus, to tell the world about Jesus. But I also had a secret prayer between me and Jesus saying, Jesus, I'll, I'll do this, I'll sing, I'll dance, but please, Jesus, don't call me to the priesthood because the priesthood was, was far-fetched from uh, who I saw myself to be. Priests were lovely, I respected them, but they were boring too. That's the ones at least that I, I was around. So I didn't want anything like that. But one day I was giving a concert in Italy and this priest walked in and he was just so full of joy and peace and he was just so cool. I remember thinking, God, I don't want to be a priest, but if I'll be anything like this guy, I'll consider it. We became friends and we started to talk about the priesthood. Then I could start, I, I imagined it. I could simply imagine myself a priest. But there was a problem because I, I had a girlfriend and I, priests don't get married. And so I didn't know what to do. I was in a conflict. I, I wanted to consider the priesthood, but I didn't want to break the hearts of my girlfriend. And, but eventually I, I got the courage. We had the a conversation. She cried. I cried. And we decided to end the relationship. And um, she waited for many years. I was still with, um, sort of, I still loved her. Um, but eventually, um, she found someone else and she um, got engaged after I got ordained and asked me to be the celebrant at the wedding. So we're still, today we're still very close friends. I know this has nothing to do with the priesthood, but also I think it's also quite relevant because you see the way God works is when God calls us to the priesthood, He calls us, He doesn't destroy um, or, or, or spit out the, the things that, that are beautiful in our lives as well. And he respects and, and loves and brings things into order when we put God first. How did your music continue after the priesthood? Because I you know sometimes that's conflicting, you know, that you have this, now you're in a parish, now your duty is to this. But you were able to continue that passion, that love yet for music to bring the gospel to much a, a bigger audience. And you eventually ended up being in the X Factor in Australia. And, and, and I know you, you've already shared the story. You don't have to share it again if you don't want to. But um, how did you continue the music? And then when did you feel at a point where it was the music too much? Or did you find the right balance? And how did you find the right balance? Music was always part of my life. But I was ready to give it all up. I said, God, I want the priesthood. If, 
if you want to take the music away. In fact, I was ready to, to give it all away. I kept my guitar, I kept playing music um, in my room. Eventually, the rector of the seminary said, hey, I can hear a guitar in there. Um, when I'm passing by, would you be interested in playing um, for some reflections? And I, so I did, and, and then seminarians were asking, hey, can you help me with this? And I was, eventually played some songs in the liturgy. And, but then what happened was in 2008, uh, the World Youth Day um, happened and this was in Sydney and I had recorded an album before I was a priest and it ended up on the desk of the organizer of World Youth Day and he called me up and said hey we have this event um, we'd love you to participate and so that was the first time I got to sing for the Holy Father Pope Benedict at the time uh, and uh, they put me on the main stage and I was still a seminarian I was terrified I was scared I hadn't been in front of an audience singing for a long time in fact in the footage I'm so scared that I, my fingers are almost bleeding at that point. I'm absolutely terrified. But, um, and that, that put me on a world stage. Now, all of a sudden, I get invitations to sing and to play in different places, but always in the obedience of, of my superiors. So I always kept asking, can I do this? Do you need me to do this? Are you okay with me to do this? And it was about serving the church. It was never about my music, never about my agenda. And so I continued to play music. I continued to serve the Lord. One second. So, so we'll let them. This one we cannot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had a group last time walk by and it was like, oh yeah, this one we'll stop for. Obrigado. I don't know if I, I hit the point that you asked. But... No, 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 you did. You, so the, probably the continuation is like, how did. Um, how did that be become the flourishing aspect of it? From so your bishop, you would ask your bishop, right, to to get permission, permission, permission. But then your bishop saw the the opportunities yes, yes. for evangelization. So from there, that's okay. that's where we can start. So it was always done in in discussion and obedience to the bishop, and still is till today. But one of the things that happened was that the bishop started to see that vocations were coming out of this that people were coming back to the church because of the ministry that i was doing and and like all glory to god but um he saw the fruit of it and i think this is what the scripture says right so it's by by the, your fruit they will know and so he started to encourage me and also provide me with platforms to do it within the diocese i started to run the youth ministry within our diocese and then continue to play music. Today, this is what I do. I don't consider myself a musician. I play, uh, but I'm, I have a preaching ministry. So I preach all around the world. I speak to over a million students all across the world, usually in high schools, students who don't care about Jesus or religion, but I get to do it. And, and I use music as part of this. And then there come these mountaintop moments, like World Youth Day, where I actually get to sing to people who love Jesus. <laughs> you know, people who, want to know, want to worship. So I'm not a worship leader in that sense where I, I, I sing to and I lead people into worship, except at Mass, of course. But um, I'm an evangelist. This is what I do. I, I use music this way. And uh, World Youth Day for me is the biggest encouragement. Uh, I, I wish every day was like this, <laughs> but it isn't. But, and I, wish, I know that every person who comes to World Youth Day wishes every day was like this. But this is our transfiguration moment and Jesus often every time tells us to go back down, right? And to go back down and, and meet, bring this experience to the reality we live in. From the, from the, so pa was Panama the first time that you said, um, now, now you're a priest and now you're, you got this platform to be able to, to, to bring the message of, of Christ's encounter. Was Panama the first time that you actually were able to perform uh, or was it Poland? So the, my first experience of performing at World Youth Day was Madrid and oh, then okay. Poland. This was p post ordination. Yes, so I was uh, um, just a newly ordained priest and I spoke uh, <laughs> and, and sang at the Canadian gathering, at the Australian gathering, and I got to perform um, and, and lead people at, at World Youth Day. And that was an experience like no other. Just seeing the universal church responding to the universal language of music. I thought, wow. Wow, what, a, what an incredible gift and what an incredible honor that the Lord allowed me to use it. And then from there, it was World Youth Day in, in Poland. And after that, I skipped the Brazil one and then the, um, the Panama. 
And so Panama was my the biggest one because I got to sing on the main stage for um, all the people at for the vigil. I mean, that's vigil, not yeah. just any main stage. This was the vigil with yes. the Holy Father, who was in it was in a, was a little asleep. time of adoration. He was, was asleep. Was he asleep? <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he was asleep. <laughs> no, I, was, well, there's debate. If you look at the footage, some say he was asleep, some say he was praying. <laughs> but in, in, in this, and I remember you telling us the story of this, that you uh, had it all planned out, ready to do live, and then they told you, yes, no live. You no. are doing a pre-recorded I session. I was there, like, I was at the sound check, and they said, give me the recording. I said, I don't have the recording. I, I'm singing live and they looked at me really strange like I, I don't know if you didn't get, I don't know if you got the memo or not but you're not singing live so I remember Australia was um, this was nighttime Australia was daytime I'm calling my producer I say hey I'm, I'm going to look for a studio here I'm going to record the guitar uh, and the vocal please mix it for me just gen, general mixing and send it back to me and so within a few hours while I was sleeping they I found a studio at night, and by the next morning, I had a little recording um, of the live event, which uh, of the uh, um, of the song I sang at the live event. And what did that feel like for you, emotionally, as, as a priest, but also as a as someone who is? I mean, because I, I know those moments is you're pouring your heart out. There's no like I'm leading people in a song. You're in front of our Lord, and you're pouring your heart out, and people are just happening to be there, yes. doing the same with you. What was that like for you? Well, I think that a lot was going through my head at that point. And one is that the overwhelming um, experience of being on, um, being in front of Jesus and, but it's not like I, I am in front of Jesus often, you know, with the Eucharist, but it was being in front of Jesus with the multitude of saints. It was like behind me, there were a million people adoring the same Jesus that I was adoring. And I just, I don't know, I got that overwhelming experience. Then looking up to the Holy Father and seeing him asleep, and I'm just thinking, okay, hey, this is my uh, one moment I get to sing for Jesus, but also for you, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, man, I can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had no idea that he was asleep. Um, okay, so to, to kind of wrap things up, now we're in Lisbon, sorry. So... What is your hopes and aspiration now coming to Lisbon 2023? COVID is, is kind of hit a very difficult spot for many young people. Many people that you evangelize, maybe many people that you minister to even in your parish, in your diocese. But now, you're, now we're finally to the point where everything's back to normal. But here we are in Lisbon, finally a World Youth Day. What's, what are your hopes and aspirations of this World Youth Day? And what, are you, what is your hopes and aspirations as a priest, as a musician, to achieve here in Lisbon? Well, ever since the doors reopened um, through COVID, because of COVID, because of the lockdowns, um, I've seen the generations being lost, generations being lost to the church, generations being lost to be able to engage, to, to respect, to love, especially in schools, have lost their sense of community, have lost their sense of purpose and belonging. And while before previous generations there was a consistency, now there's every person, half the people here come here where they are, we're at such an impressionable age during the lockdowns that, that they are changed forever. So I think this is more significant than any other World Youth Day in a time where people need community more than ever. They need enthusiasm more than ever. They need Jesus more than ever. They need the, the church, the mother, they need mother church more than ever. So if out of this moment, this experience, these young people come out with a sense that, hey, uh, I, I can do this. Hey, I'm, I, I'm loved. I'm loved by the church. I'm loved by God. But also I'm not in this alone. I think this, the impact is going to be so much bigger than any other World Youth Day. Simply because there's a deep, deep vacuum in the hearts of these people that needs to be filled and I know that God is ready um, I just pray that the, the hearts of these young people will be ready and you find that the theme of the World Youth Day kind of fits to this absolutely with rise up and, and you know in a sense and rise haste. up and go make haste yeah, that's right and so th that's well, them being here they have risen up they have come they have got uncomfortable they've 
got here and now hopefully we, they will receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit Acts 1 verse 8 which was the World Youth Day theme of, of um, Sydney, yeah. Sydney and they'll be quickened by the Spirit to be able to go out in haste and through the intercession of, of our Blessed Mother as well who herself in, in experiencing I love the mystery of, of the visitation because this is what it is she got up and she went with haste but she went she received Jesus but she went with haste to serve others and this is again what our, this generation needs it needs to get over itself and go and serve and go and love yeah any final thoughts that it runs through your heart or your mind that you want young people to know from from the heart of Father Rob and his and his great work I mean you can probably share a little bit about how what you're doing now yeah. and then go from wherever more you want to add to and then I mean, this could probably go be real, but it could also be in the A. Yeah. You figure it out, but whatever is in the heart that really strikes you being here now after having, I mean, you're in Fatima out of all places, right? A really amazing place. And you're getting ready to prepare your 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 work in, in, in Lisbon for this World Youth Day, but also how far you guys have come as Father G Ministries and so on, how it's expanded. Tell us a little bit about that too. In all of this, I know that God uses every situation, Romans 8, 28, every situation for the good of those who love Him. And I know that God is going to take the brokenness and, and the, the struggle of the world over the last few years and make something beautiful out of it. And I saw this in my life, in my ministry. You know, again, in, when the lockdowns happened, I thought, okay, that's it. My traveling is over. My evangelization is over the way I know it. Um, I'm not that young anymore. I, I, I'm, I'm that God maybe is done with me here. But it was the opposite, you know, through lockdown, through all of this, our ministry, FRG ministry, blew up. It's like we're reaching now 4 million, 4 million people through our resources. And again, what I'm saying here is that don't limit God. Don't limit God. If, even if you feel you're at the end and this is the last push, the last chance, the last go you're giving it, don't limit God because God is going to... He, he surpass your expectations. He's able to do so much more than you could ever hope or imagine. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about what God is going to do through my ministry, but not about my ministry, but what God is going to do in your life, in the lives of, of the people who are listening, in the lives of people who are here. Just don't limit God. Expect big things because we serve a big God. We serve a great God who's able to do more than you could ever hope or imagine. Wonderful. Father, thank you so much for your zeal, your passion, and your yes to your vocation every day because what you do for the church is a blessing. 